Coming up on DTNS, Twitter has a new way to handle conversations, tech to keep you from getting hit by a car. And Shannon Morse and Bill Detweiler tell us some of the coolest things they saw at CES 2020. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, January 8th, 2020 in Las Vegas. I'm Tom Merritt. And I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm Bill Detweiler. You're speaking off camera, the show's producer. Because <laughs> he's busy producing, folks. Uh, we were just talking about some of the, the details of CES, the, the food and the, the crowds and all of that. If you want to get that conversation, you got to get a good day internet at our Patreon, patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start this show with a few tech things you should know. Apple announced it paid $155 billion to developers since 2008. That's up from $120 billion in January of last year, which put total sales of about $50 billion in 2019. After the assumed 70% of app sales developers take, that would give Apple $15 billion in revenue. That growth is 2.9% higher than $34 billion in 2018, but a slowdown from 30% growth in 2017. Cybersecurity research firm Checkpoint Research says it found multiple vulnerabilities in the TikTok app. One let a hacker spoof text messages to seem like they were coming from TikTok, uh, send a fake link, then a TikTok account. A hacker could also redirect a user to malicious websites that looked like TikTok's homepage. Checkpoint says it told TikTok about the vulnerabilities in November, and they have since been fixed. Chrome's latest update for desktop and mobile will automatically cut back on notifications for users who tend to block them, or the, those requests uh, often, as well as sites with low opt-in rates. Users can also manually opt in to have fewer notifications in their settings as well. Samsung forecast its quarterly operating profit to fall 34% to 7.1 trillion won for Q4. That, that's less than analysts expected, so it's actually good news and indicates that memory chip prices might have bottomed out, furthering the belief that chip prices will rebound this year. Samsung's forecasted earnings from chips and mobile devices look like they're going to beat expectations. Mobile sales rose, partly due to overseas losses in market share by Huawei that went to Samsung. There was also a boost in the, well, the premium phone sales became a beast. There was a boost in that. Samsung Samsung's display business lagged, however. Samsung shut down an LCD production line in September and suffered from falling prices and reduced demand for TV and smartphone screens, as well as competition from their Chinese rivals in that space. But mostly good news for Samsung. Spotify announced streaming ad insertion for Spotify podcast ads that give advertisers who have ads on Spotify podcasts and also the podcast creators data like ad impressions, frequency, reach, plus anonymized age, gender, and device type. Spotify's SAI Tech will start for Spotify's own original and exclusive shows. Puma tested SAI with host read ads in its original podcast, Jamel Hill is Unbothered. Spotify says it has about 500,000 podcasts on the platform and hundreds of originals. All right, let's talk about uh, one of the products that's an emblematic of, of a sleep tech trend here. Linksys Vila mesh routers uh, are the ones that analyze your Wi-Fi signal for small delays. They announced those back in the fall. They detect motion. So when the feature's turned on, it can give you an alert if it detects something is moving around in your house, but without having to have a camera see everything. At CES, Linksys is introducing wellness pods. So using some artificial intelligence software from Origin Wireless, the pods measure disruption in radio waves between the two Linksys VLOP nodes to track your breathing patterns and then be able to use some machine learning to detect your sleep quality. It can also detect things like falls, which would be good as you're getting older. Linksys Aware software already does that measurement of the motion detection 30 times a second. Add the wellness pod into the network, and that increases to 1,500 times a second, which is why they're able to get the minute measurement that are needed. This aware costs you $2.99 a month right now for the motion, but if you get the wellness pod, then that'll be part of that service as well. And the wellness pods arrive later this year, though they didn't give us a price for those yet. Yeah, I think that's really cool, actually, because there's a lot of technology or a lot of applications for camera tech for camera technology that maybe we don't want to use because of privacy issues, yeah, yeah. Uh, especially in, um, this is for a uh, home and for sleep, but especially in the workplace. And if you have a jurisdiction where there's a lot of legal restrictions on sure. the use of cameras for privacy rules, then sort of non photographic technology like this, that still accomplishes the same thing, either tracking motion, tracking movement, tracking this is a real benefit without the privacy concerns. It gives you the yeah. benefits without the downsides. People don't yeah. want to put a camera in their bedroom. That's right. <laughs> well, well, some people might. Most sometimes, <laughs> quite often. Yeah. 
I feel the exact same way, Bill. Uh, privacy was a huge concern of mine when I was reading this. And as soon as it said, like, the, this is a cameraless detection uh, using the radio waves, sounds really fascinating. It sounds like something that could be very accurate, especially since it's checking so often. Uh, that also sounds like, since it is just checking and it doesn't seem like it's going to be pinging out a lot of information, uh, I don't think it's going to affect your network too much, yeah, but you know, time will tell if that's mm. going to be a use case issue. But I don't think it will. Um, love that it's free if you already have the the per month fee or if you already pay for the annual fee uh, with, with the Linksys um, annual subscription. So that's cool too. I'm glad yeah. that they are making you pay more. And I know this, this is new, but I would love to know after there's a little bit more research between something like breathing patterns or like what my Fitbit is measuring, which is heart rate, how they differ, if, if one ends up being better than the other, if a combination of both is yeah, something that yeah. can be achievable, where, where we really get a better sense of, of, of how we're sleeping at night kind of comes into yeah, play. Yeah, could you combine different data points for more accuracy? That'd yeah. be cool. And it'd be really cool if there was some, you know, we talk about interoperability all the time, right? Yeah, yeah. If there was some standard. So we were talking about sleep tech earlier, and so Philips has an updated version of their headband. It oh, right. tracks your REM stage for sleep to help mm -hmm. you fall asleep, to wake you up when you're in light stage of sleep. They have a band that goes across your chest to help you uh, combat snoring. It'd be cool if you could pair that kind of data with your fitness tracker, whatever mm -hmm. you're wearing on your wrist, with something like this from uh, Linksys, from, and, and get a more complete picture of your just overall health and wellness. That's kind of advanced trend, because we, we know that uh, Apple, Google, and Amazon are, are working on an open standard for smart home interoperability. Uh, you can sort of see if that is, if they're able to pull that off down the road, some sort of uh, health data, mm -hmm. you know, instead of all having to pick health kit or Amazon or something else, right? Or Fitbit, which will be Google, you know, within a few months, probably. Uh, it, I, I would look for that. I would look for, for some kind of standards organization to start organizing at some point. It's a, it's a good long-term trend to spot. Well, some interesting news coming out of Twitter that will affect threads going forward. Twitter's director of product management, Suzanne G, announced that Twitter is preparing a setting for conversation participants on the compose screen. It will have four options. So let's say you're about to compose a tweet, you want to hit send, what are you going to do? You have global, you have group, you have panel, and you have statements. Global will let anyone reply, that's how it works now. Group will limit replies to people you follow and also mention. Mm -hmm. So you're following the people and they're also in the tweets. Panel is just people mentioned in the tweets and statement would be a tweet with no replies allowed. I just want to say something and throw it out into the void and you can look at it and that's the end of it. Twitter will launch experiments by, this, uh, by the end um, in Q1 with the idea of launching it globally by the end of the year. Z also said in a threaded conversation view that's been tested in the public prototype beta app will come to the main Twitter app in the coming months. And it's important to note that you can still quote tweet somebody. It doesn't mean that you can't sort of throw your hat in the yeah. ring when it comes to the conversation, but it won't be in the thread itself. Someone. Yeah. Just unless, won't be unless, part of the unless thread. Unless they've blocked you. Yeah, you yeah. can still do that, but you're kind of going to be coming from left field at that point. Well, it makes sense with this threaded conversation uh, interface coming that they'd want to make that a more quality thread so it's not just full of, of random stuff. And, and this is a way to control what kind of conversation it's going to be. I like that the person who's starting the thread has this kind of control because there's been lots of times when I just like straight up want to just echo chamber something out there and I don't necessarily want replies, uh, whether it's just like complaining about a piece of tech and I don't necessarily need to know how to fix it, even though everybody on Twitter wants to tell me vent, how. Right? I just yeah. want to vent. Yeah, so yeah. I would love this idea of like turning off comments, basically, which is very similar to a lot of other social networks. Uh, I, I, I think it's really cool and um, would be also useful for like harassment and stuff, even though, again, you can still quote tweet. Yeah. Protitude in our chat room says uh, that they will use the statement uh, no reply option and end all tweets with I have spoken. <laughs> <laughs> and mic drop. <laughs> Does anyone think, though, that this changes the nature of Twitter in and of itself? Is it a big enough change well, I think the, to the platform? That you know, I was talking to a friend about this uh, earlier today, and I said, what do you think about this? And he said, okay, well, let's say there is somebody who tweets something incendiary or maybe they're, you know, the political slant or some other reason that a tweet is polarizing. And they want to follow a bunch of people that they know are going to give positive feedback. And so they're kind of controlling whatever the thread ends up looking like after the fact. That is you know, potentially a problem. It, of course, depends on the content of the tweet and, and, and what uh, the person was going for originally. But 
I can see where threads, which kind of half work anyway, as they, as they stand now, it seems like, okay, you, you have a little bit more control as an individual, but it, it almost sounds to me like it's going to confuse somebody all that much more about what the public sentiment is over something that would have a lot of conversation if they're not paying enough attention based on these new rules. This doesn't yep. fix Twitter. No. I don't okay. think it's meant to fix Twitter. Right, yeah. But it, it fixes a specific use case, which is uh, thread getting hijacked. I, I think we've all and, been part of something where yeah. we say something about one thing and then other people jump in and start having a conversation with each other and they weren't even part of the original thing. And you're like, can I unsubscribe to this? this? To, so, my, own, to yeah. my own thread. And I, and I think from a broadcaster perspective, you know, it's it's really interesting um, because so often you'll put out a news story. I, I'll just not to take it in a political bent, but since we're here at CES, um, we had people cover Ivanka Trump. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. At her uh, interview the today, the keynote. Yeah. Um, and immediately the threat, you know, it was like, hey, here's what Ivanka Trump, straight news coverage of the event. And immediately it gets hijacked yeah, yeah, by sure. yeah, why are you, you know, people on both sides of the spectrum sort of commenting on that. And so as someone that just wants to say, hey, we wrote about this. Why don't you come and read it? Um, and then, you know, if you, you know, it, it allows the conversation not to be hijacked by people that just want to vent. Well, and that's a, that's a great example because you could put that out as a statement and then and your that's feed exactly doesn't right. get a bunch of replies. But someone can quote retweet it and start their own conversation with other people about it yes. however they want. And that's fine. Uh, Google's Project Zero has a good reputation for finding vulnerabilities in all kinds of software, not just Google, but often rubs the companies with the vulnerabilities the wrong way because of its disclosure policy. Up until now, the policy has been to disclose a vulnerability as soon as it's fixed, whether the company that fixed the vulnerability wants it disclosed or not. And you've seen that happen with Microsoft and Google and a lot of other companies in Google. So for 2020, Project Zero will try out a policy of disclosing vulnerabilities only after the 90-day window has expired, uh, unless the company fixing the vulnerability agrees with Project Zero to disclose early. So fixed or not, at 90 days they disclose. If, if the company says, you know what, I, we're good, we're good, you can go ahead and disclose early, then Project Zero will. The idea is to allow for multiple patches that are more thorough to be applied before disclosure therefore encouraging better patch adoption by users. They're finding some people saying like, look, it actually encourages us to, to slap a fix out there uh, it, the way you're doing it now. Give us the full 90 days so we can, we can put a patch out and keep working on it in silence until the 90 days is up. It also means an incomplete fix would just be put into the 90 day report rather than generating a new deadline. So if you, it also discourages incomplete fixes because you don't get extra time by not having a complete fix. At the end of 12 months, Project Zero is going to decide whether to make the changes permanent or not. I mean, I think this is a great idea, actually. Yeah. I mean, it's always a tough decision to err on the side of disclose or not disclose. Does disclosing encourage companies to fix their crappy code or does it allow attackers to use, you know, the, those vulnerabilities? And so I think... This sounds like maybe more of a happy medium. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So 90 days is the pretty much the average of what most companies do for bug bounties. I am curious to hear what like my InfoSec friends have to say about this, since a lot of them do work in bug bounties, uh, because they would probably have some pros and cons to share as well. Um, I do think it's good because, as you mentioned, a lot of companies just try to push those patches out there way too quickly. They don't actually fix the issue. And then that might keep their consumers vulnerable. However, I am also concerned that if a company does not agree to that, um, let's go ahead and disclose early 90 days, uh, if they do fix something, like, like say within 30 days, and they don't actually get that disclosure out there until 90 days, that's an additional 60 days that people could have been like updating their products mm -hmm. that they may not hear about it because it hasn't been sized. Yep. So if they don't do push updates, for example, then I, I would like to see like maybe some kind of additional agreement. Like if you do fix this in 30 days, even if you don't agree, maybe we could update it. But I think that's why they're doing the 12 month test yeah. is to say, look, the reason we don't do it this way now is we're worried about that. We're yeah. worried about users, right? But we know that's a small percentage chance. So we're hoping it's just a small percentage chance of people that will have a fix and not want to disclose. Mm -hmm. Let's try it for 12 months and see how it goes. I think that's a smart way to do it. 
big trend here at CES this year, smart security products. Uh, and in that vein, August introduced a version of its smart lock that's easy to install and also doesn't need a hub. The new Wi-Fi smart lock is 45% smaller and 25, 20% thinner than the old smart lock pro. And as its name implies, the Wi-Fi smart lock connects directly to Wi-Fi without needing a hub. Also means it's not Z-Wave compatible, so might not be the right choice if you've got a Z-Wave hub. August locks have always been bolted into the back half of the lock rather than requiring to replace it. Works with Amazon Voice Services, Google Assistant, and Apple's HomeKit, and is powered by two CR123 batteries. An option in the app lets you automatically order replacement batteries from Amazon when it's close to time to replace them, and it will be available in black or silver later this year, although no official price yet. Yeah, smart locks have, have gotten simpler at the show, mm -hmm. it seems like. We've, we've seen NFC smart locks that are offline. We've we've seen ones that are powered by infrared, uh, yeah, collimated laser beams and all kinds of stuff. There's, it's really been interesting to see the wide variety. And not just smart locks, but we've also seen a lot of IoT in general starting to go very hubless. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty awesome that all of these companies are trying to make it easier for folks to implement. Um, maybe that will open up more people to vulnerabilities. So hopefully Google Project Zero will be checking on all those new <laughs> smart home devices coming out because that might still be a problem. <laughs> but yeah, it's cool. It, it looks like a really nice device. Um, I know that there have been smart lock vulnerabilities in the past. So hopefully August is doing a good job of making sure that's not an issue with this new product. Um, but it sounds like they're using the same kind of uh, implementation as the the other version that they already have on the market. Right, the hubbed version, yeah. not the hubless version. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I guess I'll have to replace the August that I have now with the new one. <laughs> I still have the old one that requires Bluetooth. Uh-huh. You know, oh, yeah. Your phone. So, yeah. I mean, and we were talking about interoperability earlier. This yeah. is what I think with all these IoT devices and smart devices, whether they're locks or cameras or your light bulbs, you know, it needs to be easy and simple. I was talking to yeah. someone earlier today about this very thing, and they're like, I don't want 15 apps on my phone, one for my lights, one for my lock, mm -hmm. one for my cameras, one for this, to be able to control all these devices. I just yeah. want to be able to do it through uh, Apple, through my you know, HomePod, through my uh, Echo devices, through yeah. whatever it is, Samsung, Google Assistant, whatever, whatever, whatever yeah, it is yeah. you have, mm -hmm. I want to be able to have them all work together and be simple and easy to use. Just keep it secure. Make sure these companies aren't sacrificing the security of the product to make it more convenient for consumers. I realize like convenience is really important, but a lot of companies just d overlook the security that a lot of these IoT products should have. All right, this one's a, a little bit high concept, so, so bear with me. Ars Technica reports on Harman's implementation of vehicle-to-pedestrian systems, or V2P, you'll hear it said sometimes, meant to help cars avoid hitting people on foot, or cyclists, uh, it falls into this as well. The Harman system uses 5G peer-to-peer -peer signals to detect a smartphone in the vehicle's path. So if a smartphone's in your path, it's likely on a person. The vehicle not only gets the info, but the pedestrian or cyclist phone gets an alert too. Now, there's a lot of questions about how this is going to be implemented and how that alert gets to the phone and how the person notices that it's there. But the idea is that both the car and the pedestrian get an alert that says, hey, look out. Uh, V2P is not new, but Ars Technica's Jonathan M. Gitlin notes that Savari announced the New York City Department of Transportation will deploy its Smart Cross V2P system, which can alert pedestrians about traffic light status, as well as vehicle to pedestrian enabled vehicles when pedestrians are present. So we may finally be starting to see this technology that's been around for a long time be implemented. A lot of people thought it was going to be vehicle to vehicle, but there's been problems getting everybody to agree how to play in that ballpark. It may be pedestrian hits first. You know, it could be. I mean, there's so much much is happening behind the scenes with 5G, you know, with the ultra low latency, with the high bandwidth that you really need to have vehicle to vehicle, vehicle infrastructure and vehicle to person kind of communication in real time. Just starting to see some of these technologies um, enter that kind of real world like use case test. So, I'm, you know, I'm excited to see how this starts that transition too to autonomous vehicles. You know, truly autonomous vehicles, uh, vehicles as a service, mm -hmm. you know, and how that affects sort of transportation in general, whether you're walking or whether you're in a car. And Shannon, you mentioned this before the show that, you know, the timing of all of this is really important. I mean, this is essentially the equivalent of me being like, someone's about to hit Tom, watch out. 
is Tom going to run out of the way in time? Is that enough time for him to be like, heads up, oh, I'm in danger kind of thing? Yeah. Um, that is, I mean, that's case by case. It's a big integration question, is how, especially how are they going to make sure that that message is received in time to make sure the person, the pedestrian, is not run over while they're walking across a crosswalk. I mean, pedestrian deaths are on the rise while yeah. vehicle uh, like in-car deaths are declining. Yeah. So this is a problem that needs to be solved. And I problem. think the idea is, well, some kind of alert is better than having no alert. Right. Uh, yeah. You know. And, and having both the car and the pedestrian in that scenario, having a no yeah, alert yeah. at the same time, so does maybe, double up on You have safety. like a, a, a double chance of somebody at least seeing that notification. Right. So yeah. either the pedestrian stops or maybe the car stops. I can imagine down. a lot of people will have earpods on yeah. if, or earphones on if, if this is a problem, if they're not paying attention and then mm -hmm. some kind of alert coming you know interrupting what you're listening to says hey watch out um stop looking at the sidewalk <laughs> look up <laughs> yeah maybe it just nags you like, <laughs> right. watch where you're going Come on. You're going to get hit if you That's act this way any longer. <laughs> all right, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Uh, the past couple of days, if you missed the show, go back and listen to them. We, we have covered all of the major announcements at CES, all the things getting buzzed, all the things that caught our eye. Uh, and today, it's a nice chance to sort of take a step back and get a perspective on, on maybe some of the things we missed or some of the things we want to spend a little more time with. So we're asking Shannon and Bill uh, to share some of the things that, that they've seen uh, that have caught their eye. And Shannon, we'll, let's start with you. What have you been looking at? Yeah. So have y'all heard about Celestron's new application that they were showing off at one of the press events. Yeah, the, the telescope related thing. I heard about that. It was really cool. I'm, I, I'm from like an astronomy background, so I was really excited about it. It's like live long and prosper. StarSense Explorer, that's the application name. And it's a application that teaches you and educates you about what's around us in the universe, but it also connects to a telescope. So it will help you really easily and really quickly find all of these different things in the sky and be able to see them through a telescope. It's really fascinating. Um, telescopes for the longest time, if you wanted really good lenses, they're insanely expensive. And if you want to bring those into like a classroom setting or if you want to bring those home for kids, it's very hard to introduce that because it kind of prices people out of that market. So they're putting this information in this technology onto your phone so when you purchase the telescope, you're you're only purchasing the lens and the metal. You're not uh, purchasing uh -huh. motors mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. computerized parts. So that's keeping the price down for the telescope. The application itself is free and you could use it to like educate yourself. But what you're really getting is the ability to quickly and easily find things in the universe that you can look at through a telescope. I mean, nothing will replace that father-son bonding I had of my dad going, no, 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 Jupiter's <laughs> right there. <laughs> no, hold it right there. But, but I, I think this probably is progress. It was really cool. So I definitely got a demo. I'm hoping I can get a review product so I can actually see it myself. It would be really fun. Um, I'm sure you've probably mentioned the Alienware concept UFO. I know you talked a little bit about that. Um, that was something that I was really interested in. From my perspective, I'm not comparing it to a Nintendo Switch because it runs full Windows 10. I have this huge backlog of Steam video games that I've purchased throughout the 10, 15 years that I've been playing PC games. So the idea of being able to take that onto a remote device even if you want to plug it into a larger monitor, maybe in my in my uh, living room, for mm -hmm, example. Mm -hmm. uh, this is something that's really enabling me to take all that information with me. I don't have to like, it's like taking the old school LAN parties of gigantic PCs that you would tote with you to the <laughs> yeah. local community center and instead sticking it in your pocket. Yeah, bring the LAN with you. Also, I want to run Doom on it and stick Linux well, on course, it because obviously. why not? Why wouldn't you? Why yeah. wouldn't I? Uh, the last one I wanted to mention as well was Asus. So they are doing some new PCs, mini PCs and hobbyist boards. Um, the Tinker Board R and I believe the other one was called the T. But these are basically like comparable to Raspberry Pis. Uh, with Raspberry Pis, you have a lot of abilities. You can do like a pie hole or a home theater PC, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this one can do facial recognition. You can run some awesome technology on it to do facial, facial recognition. So like companies could use these, uh, but you could also use it as a consumer trying to learn about boards and how you can do different open source software, how, how you can create your own home theater PC, how you can run like an audiophile device. Also, it's kind of limitless in the fact that 
uh, Asus has the hardware capabilities um, to make it a lot more powerful than the Raspberry Pis currently are. So they're bringing a lot of that like hardware background that they have into these little boards. And I love that they're creating a more competitive marketplace for folks that are into Raspberry Pis and Arduinos and things of that nature. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm excited to see it. They have like a GitHub open source community. They have a forum. So lots of people seem to be pretty involved with this. And I'm excited to see how it grows. And I kind of want to play with one. It's the Tinker, right? Tinker, That's the yes, the yeah. Tinker. Board. Yeah, very cool. It's nice. It's nice to have more of that nerd out there. For I sure. agree. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Bill, what, what's been catching your eye here? Well, you know, I focused on a lot of smart home and health and wellness tech this time around. And so there's been there's always gadgets that you look at and you go, you know, that's really cool, but do I need one of those? Uh -huh. yeah. um, a few of the things <laughs> yes. I saw. Yes, yeah, you do. <laughs> I mean, but that's, I've always heard that that's the worst question to ask at CES. Do you need it? Like, yeah. Uh, because usually the answer is no. Uh, but there's some <laughs> cool products um, that I saw that Procter & Gamble had with some of their brands. Um, Lumi was kind of this interesting product from their Pampers brand. Okay. Yeah. It was this sensor that you put on the diapers of newborns, allows you to track your newborn's movements, and then also detect whether their diaper is uh, wet and to what percentage it's wet. Yeah, so this um, is an this is an advantage. Like we've we've been watching the diaper get smarter every yes. year at CES. <laughs> that's that's, that's right. Now, yeah. and you would ask yourself, when will it change the baby for there, you? There you that's go. That's Roger's question. Yeah. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. I, I already know. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's the exact question that you have to ask yourself. Yeah. Whether it's that or Charmin was also showing off their they had their Go Lab at the PNG display, which showed off several bathroom techs, including a roll bot robot that delivered you toilet paper in the bathroom um i always ask myself is it something you really kind of need <laughs> like they're going to market with lumi it, it, it's been around for a while but they've got the final product yeah, yeah. here this year um do you really need to know exactly how how moist the, a diaper is down to the single digit percentage i don't i don't know um i have a 16 year old is daughter i changed lots of diapers i don't know if that would have made me a better parent or is given her a healthier no, life no i don't know tracking application that i don't think, well there, there's movements there's no because then they couldn't say anything you know yeah, about yeah. it being a medical device so there's a lot of things like that that i look at that are kind of neat and cool um you know we we talked a little bit about sleep tech earlier so phillips has the headband which is kind of cool designed to sort of wake you up more easily there's always fun tech um, I saw Keurig has their drink works yeah. uh, system here. If you Getting had a chance the to see that, game, yeah, right. that is exactly right. So they're pods that basically make cocktails just like a Keurig makes coffee or tea. So if you want a uh, Moscow Mule or a, um, what did they make for us today? Um, Another vodka, lemonade. vodka lemonade. <laughs> and, and so, you know, all the alcohol, the flavoring, everything is in the pod. You put it in the machine, hit the button, boom, you get a carbonated drink and chilled water if you need it. So that's kind of neat. I, I like that uh four bucks a, a drink um is about is what it costs the pods are recyclable um do you need one of those well i don't know if i need one of those but it's kind of this neat smart gadget um, in fact you may not need you may one. not you need one of those you know i don't know if i needed a smart beer fridge but they have a smart right, beer fridge right. here um i i also look for tech that's not just kind of um uh, you know, the tech that is maybe a little more meaningful, not to step on Keurig or anybody sure. else's toes. Um, but we, AARP had several demos here of tech like uh, a voice it system, which is really good. Um, it helps people that vocalize. If they have um, uh, motor neuron problems, motor problems, oh, nice. Parkinson's, things like this, mm -hmm. and they can't vocalized speech that's great um they can use ai to translate that speech mm -hmm. into words that would have and been great so, for my dad my dad yeah. had that problem after his stroke and, and you and, know some days were better than others yeah. it would have been amazing to have something and like and and you think about not only is that an, a way for those people to communicate with other people but it also unlocks a lot of smart technology that's based on voice mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. can't do that, that they can't take advantage of. Mm. Um, that's really cool. They were using AR in a really interesting way as well. Um, uh, they have an application that allows you to scan a room for potential physical hazards. And with my father, um, when we had home health come in and look, they just walked around and said, that's a fall risk. That rug mm -hmm. is going to, mm -hmm. you know, not convincing your parents to get rid of something sure. is a whole yeah. other idea. But the AR uh, application, you use a smartphone, a tablet to sort of pan around and it analyzes the images coming mm -hmm. in and looks for physical risks. So those are amongst all the kind of crazy gadgets, the wacky mercedes concept car with scales on it the right, right. you know the new ps5 logo cool yeah, but you know i love just, the five it's just a logo <laughs> and, and 
there's a five. Yeah. Um, you do have some uh, among Samsung's wacky neon, you uh-huh, know, whatever yeah. we're going to do with those things. You know, I, I do like that there's some sort of serious tech that will have yeah, yeah. real differences and make um, yeah. a real difference in people's lives. If there's one thing, I, I w- there's always one thing that I wish we had more time to cover more in depth. It would be the water conservation tech. Yes. I saw a lot of that. Oh, yeah. We just didn't really get today. to it. Uh, you, home water purification, water reuse, uh, water saving, uh, a lot of that kind of tech here as well. And there was there was a company that had um, that was showing off growing um, crops in um, shipping containers. Mm-hmm. You know, you could have like 10 different crops rotating through these regular, you know, shipping containers. Um, and you were talking about with water, pulling water out of the air. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's really cool stuff that I think oftentimes is eclipsed, unfortunately, by the really big TVs. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're, we actually have time for some emails today, don't we? Yeah, we do. Uh, so let's check out uh, the mailbag. First one comes from Nathaniel. You know, in fact, we were talking about... Um, uh, mesh routers being able to detect falls. Uh, and he says, I'm a residential electrician. I'm actually working on a home owned by an older couple. They asked me to troubleshoot help with their Echo Dot setup. They're using it as a help I've fallen array. Ah. Good for contacting mm. family members. You don't have to wear it 100% of the time anyway. And it can be programmed with <gasps> local emergency numbers. Nathaniel says, I believe Echoes don't call 911, so be aware. Mm-hmm. You might need to add local first responders into the address book yourself. But I hope this helps someone with age or disability issues. Oh, that's very cool. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Well, let's give a shout out to our patrons at the master and grandmaster level, including Jeff Wilkes, Sonia Vining, and Tony Glass. Thank you all for supporting the show. And thanks to Shannon Morse and Bill Detweiler for being with us on our last day of coverage at CES. Shannon, where do people keep up with your work? Uh, YouTube.com slash Shannon Morse, and that's M-O-R-S-E, like Morse code, not Morris. <laughs> I am covering CES every single day. I have multiple videos, like, ready to go, so definitely check out the channel, especially if you're interested in security and privacy, gaming products, laptops, and uh, smart home as well, although I might make fun of them a little bit if they don't have very good security, of course. And Snubsy.com for everything else, as especially ThreatWire, of course. And Bill Detweiler, thank you, too. Too, for being with us uh, the last day of CES. It's becoming a bit of a tradition. Yeah, always <laughs> glad to be here. It's always fun. Um, I, I really enjoy it. So thank you, uh, Tom uh, and uh, Shannon, for having me. I really appreciate it. Sarah. Absolutely. Sarah. Yeah, and, well, Shannon said, you know, she's on enough. <laughs> just, and thank Roger, too, while you're at it. Uh, <laughs> but, but, Roger. Uh, Roger sorry, Roger. Happen. We won't forget about you, Roger. <laughs> but, but, Bill, let <laughs> folks know where they can keep up with your work. Yeah, so they can see um, all of our enterprise coverage of CES and the tech space in general at Tech Republic and ZDNet. Uh, you can see the consumer work that we do, uh, including uh, cracking open at uh, CNET. Uh, we'll be actually cracking open a TV and a nice. Rizmo on the CNET stage live tomorrow. So that should be fun. And they can people can follow me at Twitter at Bill Detweiler. Yeah. Uh, and thanks to Bill and the folks at Tech Republic's Good Graces. You can catch a little bit of me there on the uh, top five videos as well. I, uh, so check that out, techrepublic.com. Thanks to everyone who supports the show. We're able to be here and talk to these folks in person and see this stuff ourselves, uh, bring you some video on the Patreon and on our Instagram uh, because you guys support the show. Uh, so everybody who supports the show on Patreon, thank you for making this possible. Patreon.com slash DTNS if you want to join in. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. They're giving us so so much good feedback on our coverage here. We've had a really good time, and we hope you have, too. We will be live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 21.30 UTC, back on our home bases starting tomorrow. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. See you tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. (laughs)